Welcome to the Schmidt House Podcast. I'm your host, Zach. On today's episode, I'm continuing my Harry Potter series with the seventh book slash movies, The Deathly Hallows. Since my reread is done, I have a few more episodes to close out this series in the coming months, so there will be a few more Harry Potter episodes that I have planned. The first will be a ranking of the books and movies, then I'm going to talk about the Harry Potter Lego video games, and then do a review of Hogwarts Legacy, the video game that comes out in February. There's going to be also maybe even the odd video down the road where I talk about Harry Potter again or subjects around Harry Potter. But now, let's talk about the final installment of the Harry Potter series. So for this review, I listened to this book on audiobook, just to be able to save some time. If you want to follow along with me, I have the link in the description box. I listened to the Stephen Fry version, but the Jim Dale version is just as good. I'm going to talk about the book first, then the movies, and finish with a general overview. And now to the Deathly Hallows review. This book opens up with another point of view chapter where we're taking in, into a vivid description of the Malfoy Manor, and we get to see what Voldemort and his crew have been up to. The description of the Malfoy Manor is really good, and it would be a really neat place to live. I do wonder why they have albino peacocks, though. You would think that the staunch pure-blooded wizards that the Malfoys are, they would have some type of magical creature and not a muggle animal. It's also funny how Voldemort likes to torture uh, Lucius Malfoy psychologically for the mistakes that he's done towards his goals. At the start of the second chapter, Harry makes a very good point about his education. He has There's lots of gaps in it, and one of them is particularly around how to heal himself with magic. It's something that's never taught at Hogwarts. Uh, that would for sure um, you know, be something that you maybe need some type of specialization for and require a certain amount of newts or owls to maybe even intern at St. Mungo's to be able to get that type of extra education. The second chapter of the book is also, for the most part, all about Dumbledore. And it's a really good little bit of exposition for the dead character where uh, she's able to give the reader some information on the backstory of the character that of a character that we all thought that we knew really well. Um, there's a bunch of new stuff kind of added into his, his story, which has a lot of context for the past and uh, essentially what's going on in this book as well. And I think for the most part, this type of information was probably a surprise to first-time readers. And I know it's an odd thing to, to say, but I do like funerals and eulogies and stuff like that because you get to hear people uh, tell good stories uh, about the life of someone who they know that is now deceased. And you really get to know a different side of the person that you may not have known um, by hearing other people's accounts of stories and, and things uh, that they've been able to talk about that person. And Harry reading the article in the Daily Prophet, to me, to me, serves that purpose to the readers, and it's done in a really clever way to be able to add a bunch of context to a character that we all thought we knew. It seems really out of character for Dudley to treat Harry the way he does in this book, especially in comparison to how he's treated him into the prior entries. Uh, his justification is that um, since Harry saved him from the Dementors, he kind of looks at him in a different light, but, um, you know, one thing that I've kind of thought about, especially while reading this, uh, and it kind of comes to light in this book a little bit, is maybe one of the reasons why the Dursleys were so awful to Harry is because they're living with the soul of Lord Voldemort uh, in the house for 16 years as Harry was a horcrux. The early couple of chapters of this book are really good, uh, with Harry coming to terms with everything changing around him and him having to grow and leave his known comfort behind. You'd really think that the apologies potion would be illegal, considering that <clears throat> disguising yourself as another person could really cause a lot of bad, uh, you know, if you're out there committing crimes and whatnot. Now, I'm not shaming Hagrid, but why would they put Harry with someone who isn't really skilled with magic? They could have put him with Mad-Eye Moody or um, Kingsley, right? Someone who, who's extremely competent in, in um, you know, battling dark wizards. But, um, you know, they do show that it's <clears throat> important to have him travel with Hagrid and it's kind of poetic in the way that it rhymes uh him bringing him to the Dursleys and now he's taking him away but Harry also lost a couple of things during the battle of um seven potters he uh Hedwig, Hedwig was killed which was a huge shock the first time that I read this book and then he also loses his broom that Sirius gave him uh during this escape as with the previous books I really do like the wizarding uh way of life away from Hogwarts it makes the world feel a little bit more lived in, and I like hearing experiences from people that are living at the borough and other places around the wizarding world. The relationship between Harry and Ginny has really developed well, 
And in this book, JK has finally been able to write some good romantic uh, relationships, and in the last one, actually, too, um, some good romantic scenes and uh, ultimately uh, step up Harry and Ginny's romantic relationship in this series and kind of set up her goals of having them together down the road. Um, But this was something that was horribly adapted into the movies. In regards to Dumbledore's will, why wouldn't he have just given Harry everything that he needs before he died? He knew he was going to die, he had it all planned out, but he just decided to leave everything to chance and hope that the trio would be able to figure out all of his um, half-assed clues that are spread amongst everywhere. In my mind, I don't think that this is a good idea. Uh, I also do like that Harry gives um, Scrimgeour a shit for being a bad minister for magic. This isn't in the movies, um, but Harry really um, puts him in his place for on a multiple different issues that Harry has with the ministry. And uh, it is something that I wish they would have keyed on more in the movies, um, on, in, this, uh, in the Deathly Hallows movie, and in the Half-Blood Prince, because these interactions are really good in the books. Harry being put under the Polyjuice Potion for Bill and Fleur's wedding was a good idea for the books, but I am glad that they didn't include it in the movie. With Bill's wedding, I wonder if it uh, would be a form of prenup or even part of the wedding itself for uh, the husband and wife to take part in the Unbreakable Vow. It would surely be you know, a way to reduce wizarding divorce if that's uh, such a popular thing. It's funny that Crumb uh, views the Peveril symbol of the Deathly Hallows, which is used, uh, which Grindelwald used as kind of his symbol. Crumb thinks that it was his symbol and kind of um, shames Xenophilius Lovegood for for wearing it. And it's kind of written in a way to resemble a Nazi swastika, uh, which didn't have an overly poor um, connotation prior to World War II. Um, It was a symbol that was used in multiple different cultures across the world. After the chaos at the end of the wedding and until the trio is safe at Grimmauld Place, there's almost a moment of clairvoyance that nothing is going to be the same in this book. And that goes without saying, because we knew that the trio wasn't going to go back to Hogwarts and uh, attend their seventh year. But there is something uh, that's exciting and refreshing with this changeup. And there's some scenes at Grimmauld Place, which I really, really do enjoy. It's um, Them being at Grimmauld Place is one of my favorite parts. It's one of my favorite settings in the entire series, actually. Um, and there's a really good scene at Grimmauld Place in the book that wasn't included in the movie, and I think it should have. It's uh, when uh, Harry is exploring Sirius's old bedroom, and he finds a letter and a photograph from his mom. And <clears throat> it adds both context and good character development for multiple people. And I think they should have included this because when they go through, or in the books, when they go through Snape's memories, or when Harry goes through Snape's memories, uh, Snape was at Grimald Place looking at this picture and actually ripped it in half and kept the, por- the part of the thing that had the part of the picture that had Lily in it and left the other stuff and that kind of um, took away from the the letter as well. But um, it would have been really cool to be able to reference that back and forth. When Lupin shows up to talk to the trio, he describes to them how effective Dol- uh, Voldemort has been at strategically controlling the ministry. Now, this time around, he seems a lot more competent in his actions opposed to the last time that they're having a war. But in all honesty, his reign as a dictator only lasted less than a year. And in my opinion, it's a bit lackluster. And I'm sure that JK did want to keep the series just to seven books, which makes perfect sense. But there's more than enough stuff that she could have had an eighth one and really expanded the story and made um, almost like uh, it, it into an even higher level fantasy series. But this book is excitingly different. I wonder if it was actually a better plan, opposed to trying to get in the locket from Umbridge at the Ministry, if they were able to find out where she lives and steal it from there. It probably would have been easier said than done. I like it how Creature is also nice to the trio. I think having a house elf as a friend would be pretty cool to have. When Harry told Mr. Weasley in the elevator that he was being tracked, I wonder if it also would have been a little bit advantageous for him to uh, tell him or at least hint to Mr. Weasley that he was Harry. Even just a wink or a quick flash of his invisibility cloak or something like that, I think would have um, maybe helped put Mr. Weasley or the Weasley family at a little bit of ease knowing that they're uh, safe and obviously doing something to help um, get rid of Voldemort. Umbridge is a really awful and evil woman. Even through the reread of this series, um, it just reminds me how terrible of a person she is. And she actually reminds me of Christia Freeland, who is Canada's Deputy Prime Minister. 
Splinching would really suck, and it would make sense that that would be a risk when apparating is leaving a body part behind. The locket Horcrux has some similarities with the One Ring on how Fro- Frodo experiences it from the Lord of the Rings uh, and, and the effect that it has on the trio. It, it uh, really weakens them and makes them quite irritable, having that type of dark, dark spirit in something that's uh, that they're having to carry around with them. Snape sending Neville, Ginny, and Luna for punishment for breaking into his office uh, by sending them in detention with Hagrid into the Forbidden Forest might have been a little bit of a red flag that he's not actually being a bad guy. If he was actually the villain and a villain that they kind of um, set him up to be, there'd be something much worse for breaking into his office. I wonder if Phineas Nigellus uh, continually pressed Harry and Hermione on the location on request of Snape as he needed to be able to deliver the sword to them. I remember when I first read this book, the excitement of finally being able to see Godric's Hollow. It was a place that I wanted to visit in the books much sooner than this one. Uh, Harry's parents were only 21 when they died as well, which is really crazy. The scene with the snake is probably one of the most intense scenes in the whole series. Chapter 21, which is the tale of the three brothers, is one of my favorite chapters in the book. Because up until this point, there's a lot of buildup regarding what the symbol in Hermione's book is. And I was really excited to learn another clue about the unraveling of the um, remaining plot of the series. And I remember uh, reading this book for the first time that I reread the story of the the three brothers twice, just so I understood everything that took place in that uh, little children's story. The scenes at Malfoy Manor are really tense, and it would be insane to have to experience them. This book, more so than any of the others, has so many intense scenes in it that keeps the action going. And the good thing I do like about this book particular, actually kind of the series as a whole, is JK is really good at describing what is going on in such detail to really put you in that spot. Um, You know, you can feel when she's talking about um, them being in the dungeon and they can hear Hermione screaming and stuff like that. It just adds to the intensity of it and is just described so well. Um... And I think because this book breaks the mold in certain ways than being away from school, it is a little bit easier to have that type of intensity and do crazier events. And it really does feel like a roller coaster when reading. While the death of Dobby is really well described in the books, uh, its portrayal in the film is pretty incredible. There are many people and creatures that have died in sacrifice of Harry's, but I know for many fans, the death of Dobby hits one of the hardest. The book gets better. Not that it was bad before, but it gets better once they get into Hogwarts. It's kind of like all hell breaks loose, and it's just everyone's kind of scrambling around, and there's battles everywhere, and just lots of intense scenes. I like that Harry was using the Cruciatus Curse on one of the Caros. It was a really awesome uh, little addition, and I like that Harry is willing to use the unforgivable curses in desperate situations to, or to fight Death Eaters. I wish the uh, sequence in the Ravenclaw common room would have been in the movie, I totally forgot how this uh, played out in the book until rereading it, um, <clears throat> just because I've seen the movies more than I've read the books. But it would have been nice to see the Ravenclaw, Ravenclaw common room uh, in the film. The Battle of Hogwarts is really well written. The action is well described, and it makes you feel immersed. There's so much going on, and the action is pretty nonstop, which is it makes it really enjoyable to be able to read. The story between Snape and Lily and his redemption arc is really well thought out and fits the story well. His love for Lily wasn't the explanation that I was looking for um, when I was, uh, and I don't think it's the way that it should have actually went, in my opinion, uh, for the story, though it does fit. Reading this for the first time, um, you know, I was kind of shocked about how that she came to this decision on how she was going to wrap this all up. Reading it this time around, I see how it played out more than I had previously through other read-throughs, but I still don't think that Snape should have been the key to the entire story, at least in this manner. There are some really good breadcrumbs placed throughout the books that reveal this, especially uh, the sixth book. Snape is probably one of the most tragic characters in the series, and he carries the most responsibility and has the hardest job, and is quite often the most hated throughout it all. Even Dumbledore recognizes that Snape doesn't want his best qualities celebrated. I think another reason I don't like the Snape plotline is that it it really reduces James's character, of which ever since the fifth book, it seems that J.K. has really tried to take Harry's father down a peg, and it's almost like she wanted the readers to prefer Snape and Lily uh, falling in love and being a better couple, and I just really don't like the disrespect towards James and the way that she writes it. It's almost like she's trying to cause Harry to have uh, 
a, a bunch of dislike for his father as well. There is one line when Harry is about to use the resurrection stone. He says that he is ready to die and that it doesn't matter to bring them back because he's about to join them. He wasn't fetching them. They were fetching him. And it's a really good line that outlines the relationship that we have with uh, deceased loved ones when it's our turn to die. It's almost a, a really... Uh, the way that it's described in the book, and I think it kind of mirrors real life, is that you get this like uh, moment of clairvoyance almost where you're able to kind of accept your fate and, and, and you know whatever re- the type of faith that you have, being able to... Um, you know, see deceased loved ones again is almost like an, an exciting or a comforting prospect for the most part. And I think that's what Harry is almost experiencing in this moment during the books. And, and, and it's well portrayed in the movies too. I'm really glad that there is an exposition chapter. Um, the one at King's Cross <clears throat> during, in Harry's kind of like dreamlike phase after Voldemort kills him. I would have been really upset if J.K. didn't have Dumbledore explain everything in some fashion. And I think that it's very well executed and very well done in this book, the way that it's portrayed and described and everything and just plays out in a certain way. I think it's really well done. Voldemort's death sequence was so much better in the books than the movie. Harry almost toys with him in the books um, because he knows that he's essentially conquered death and all the chips are stacked in his favor and everything's going his way. So he's almost at a point where... He's already won. It's kind of like it's a, it's a, a predetermined conclusion, and he's just able to kind of go through the motions. But during that time, he's almost like taunting um, Voldemort and, and like pushing back on all of his little, th- all of the things that Voldemort stacked all of his chips on, knowing that Harry has like an ace in the hole. So um, it's really well done in the books, but it doesn't translate over as well on screen. In the final chapter of the book, I was really glad that Harry was able to fix his original wand that was broken by using the Elder Wand. I think it also could have, this chapter could have used a little bit more of a conclusion. It just ends so abruptly, and it does give some quick explanations for a few things, but I think it would have been uh, a bit useful to be able to have another chapter after this, is to just wrap it up a little bit more neatly. And I think it would have been a little bit more satisfying to get that type of conclusion to like the current timeline rather than the epilogue that we did get. Getting to the end of the book for the first time around, um, I just was left wanting more to be able to resolve the story and kind of like wrap it up in a nice way, especially because this is like a, a children's and a, and a teen series. You would think that uh, she'd be able to, uh, like this isn't Game of Thrones in that in that sense, but it's definitely, I feel that she could have wrapped it up a little bit better. The epilogue also was not what I expected, nor what I was wanting as kind of a last way to send off and resolve the story. Um, we do find out, you know, I think it is satisfying, uh, that we're able to find out what happens later on in the trio's life. But again, it just wanted me wanting more and it makes this chapter a little bit redundant. It also makes it worse knowing that the chapter was the basis for some of the worst fan fiction ever produced, which I will not be talking about on uh, on my podcast. Uh, that being the awful non canonical uh, canonical entry, uh, at least in my mind, the cursed child. What absolute trash that is, and it just completely kind of de- derails the entire um, story arc and just diminishes everything that happened in the main series. This book is filled with. Deus Ex Machina plot devices. And the movies have even more. Every single time that we turn around, the trio is given whatever they need essentially to them on a platter. It seems that this book maybe was a little bit rushed and probably could have been used a little bit more time being written, um, especially being like the, um, you know, the final to this series. It just seems that there's certain things where just whatever needed to happen or whatever needed to happen just happened to them everything was kind of just given to them which i think is um it it kind of just shows a little bit of weak writing on jk's part i think she had some some good ideas it just the execution of them could have been a little bit better and i think that's a a common complaint when you hear people talk about the series i'm going to get into probably a couple of those things um right now the first one being um snitches having flesh memories this is one of the dumbest shoehorned plot lines that is in the entire series. She has an okay of just uh, okay justification of why uh, this would be necessary, uh, 
basically, in case there's a dispute of who caught who caught the snitch in the match, the flash memories would be a, a way to be able to prove who actually caught the snitch. But honestly, is there any realistic defense of um, wanting or taking this long to divulge this stupid fact? This could have been something that if she did think about it in the first movie or in the first book, she could have put in there. Um, you know, for all intents and purposes, Quidditch is you know, kind of like a main staple in the series, although it's kind of overlooked quite often for some odd reason, um, amongst everything, video games, movies, and even in the books. But, um, you know, when we're looking at practicing for Quidditch, do they just use old snitches? Uh, you know, do they have to use a different one for each, each, um, match or sorry, each practice, and then they get brand new ones for the match. The match is actually, you know, the one that is, uh, the important thing. And do they really need to have such a feature being such like an important thing about the snitch for essentially a high school um, sporting game? Uh, I don't know. It just seems kind of like a little a weird thing to wait for so long to be able to um, have that fact. And then the other thing that doesn't make sense about it is why does the snitch open up? It opens up so you can keep a tiny little keepsake in there which is just so convenient considering that Dumbledore put the resurrection stone in there. So congratulations, you're playing high school Quidditch, you catch a snitch and you can put a rock inside of it. It's just, it makes no sense and it's just a really weak idea for the story. It's one of the things that I, it, and whenever I, I hear about the uh, flesh memories for snitches, it just drives me absolutely mental how weak of writing that is. I think Harry should have kept Mad-Eye Moody's eye after it's all said and done, you think that the Order would have wanted to do something with it in a way to honor him. Perhaps it has some other uses that could be advantageous to Harry, but instead he just buries it in the forest, which, I don't know, I, it seems like a silly thing to do. I would have personally kept it in his little pouch. Why wouldn't they just keep the Horcrux in said pouch? Um, so the Harry has a moleskin pouch, which is given to him by Hagrid uh, for his 17th birthday. And in my mind, it would be a lot better to keep the Horcrux in there rather than exposing it uh, themselves to the darkness of the locket. Why would uh, why would Wizards of the UK not just leave the country and go to America or something, some other place, and, and lay low? It would for sure be safer than staying in the country, uh, especially with everything's going on. So if you're Muggle-born, why wouldn't you just leave the UK? Because that seems to be where this whole kind of crazy war is going on. Just apparate to another place and be able to hide out for a while. How much plot convenience is it that the trio just happens to come across Ted Tonks, Dean Thomas, and the Goblin? Um, they th- Those three people are able to provide a bunch of needed information that the trio was in desperate need for, handed to them again on a platter. This uh, There's one other in the group that really makes an astute comment about Harry, which I, which I thought I'd wanted, I wanted to highlight that it would be a good propaganda tool to keep everybody scared and on their toes if the Death Eaters had actually caught Harry and killed him, but just to keep everybody scared, they didn't publicize it. It would uh, if, they, if people knew that Harry was dead, it could create martyrs and give the rebellion a uh, rallying call. So even if they did catch and, and kill him, it's not something that they probably should have actually put out there. It would have been able to keep the, um, you know, the, them in control a lot longer. I wish we would have been able to explore Harry's house. It's one of the things that are missing from the chapters that take place in in Godric's Hollow. And I think uh, JK could have just expanded on it a bit and shown uh, Harry a little bit more than just the outside of his parents' house. I think for me in that situation, it would have been something that I would have wanted to actually go in and explore, even though the house has been uh, uh, abandoned for past like 16 years. I don't like the apparition function of the Deluminator. It doesn't really make sense on why it would function that way. Even the first time that I read the book, I thought it was strictly plot convenience that it worked like that. Why wouldn't the trio have just apparated once they got out of Gringotts on the back of the dragon? It would have been a way better idea to just apparate off of the back of the dragon um, rather rather than jumping into a random lake. But maybe if they, they tried to apparate, they would have taken the dragon with them. I don't know. I think Fred's death is probably one of the most surprising in the books. Um... It was one that I was for sure the most upset about in this book is the death of Fred. I know in interviews, JK said that she wanted to kill uh, kill off Arthur, but just had a lot of trouble doing that. Um, 
you know, she felt bad for the characters that would have survived him and chose Fred instead. And I don't think that it's uh, any more or less sad than losing Arthur. But I just wish that the Weasleys would all have all survived the Battle of Hogwarts. Narcissa Malfoy lying to Voldemort that Harry was alive makes absolutely no sense. If she was found out to be lying, it would be incredibly bad for her family. Voldemort already hates the Malfoys, so she, she, Voldemort, if, the, if, the, if Voldemort would have caught her lying, she, she'd be dead. Draco would be dead. Lucius would be dead, just immediately. Voldemort would not have um, let that slide. And when she found out that Draco was alive, there is actually no point in lying. She could have killed Harry, uh, told Voldemort that he was alive, Voldemort would have killed him again, and then she still would have been able to go into the castle triumphant. So there's absolutely no motivation for her to actually uh, lie to him, other than the fact, again, um, just plot convenience and a little bit of weak, weak writing. Now, perhaps even with her selfish reasons to lie, knowing that he was alive and had conquered death again, maybe that had put some doubt in, in her mind that um, Harry was going to be the one to come out on top. And that maybe she was considering that Voldemort just wasn't unable to kill Harry Potter. All right, and now on to the movies. So both films were directed by David Yates, who directed the prior two films as well. The score is done by Alexandre Desplat, of which uh, both of these scores are among the worst in the series, in my opinion. There's just nothing special to them for the most part. I think that both of these movies were made for people that did not read the books. It just... It feels so different, uh, the way that they took approach. I mean, the last one, they tried to make it like a romantic comedy and that didn't work either. Just there's, there's a lot of inconsistencies, inconsistencies with David Yates direction that I almost wish someone else would have, uh, especially like reading the book and seeing the movie and watching the movie right after you just remember a little bit more. And I just really think that maybe David Yates didn't do the best job at the, at the ones that he did direct, um, as far as, um, the, the way that he chose to adapt it. Um, ultimately, the director is the most important piece in the filmmaking process, but uh, it might come down to the script writing and stuff like that or the production as well. But I really do think that David Yates probably could have done a better job, particularly on the last two uh, installments in the series. If these movies were made for people that didn't read the books, it seems to be the only explanation for some of the things that they did change and um, you know the direction that they went with plot-wise. Uh, you know, and the things that they choose to ignore or change uh, with the added runtime of two films. And this book is not the longest one in the series. You think that they would have been able to stick closer to the source material. The scene at Malfoy Manor is really well done. Uh, I like the aesthetics of it. They're really good and they match the description from the book fairly well. Uh, the only thing that's really missing is just the albino peacocks. And right off the bat, I must say, I say this pretty much every single time, uh, but Alan Rickman's Snape is so good from the second that he is on screen. He is by far the best casting for any character in the entire series. I would put him number one, probably Hagrid number two, and um, Daniel Radcliffe as Harry as number three. Um, but Snape is just absolutely masterful the way that he commands every single scene. Just the little, little subtleties, the little looks, the little things that he does um, far better than I, I would say anybody else does in the series. Not that there's... Uh, a ton of bad actors. I think the you know the casting for the series as a whole is really well done, but just Snape, uh, Alan Rickman, Snape just knocks it out of the park every single scene. The Polyjuice uh, potion scene was really well done. Uh, you know when everyone's changing into Harry, and it's quite comical and uh, you know just cool the way that they did it, and they kind of have a, like a um, you know a panning shot where you see everybody in different phases of being changed and stuff like that, and their reactions to changing into Harry. It's 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 quite cool. It also makes good sense to have changed the Ted Tonks Ted Tonks scene uh, to the burrow. It streamlines a little bit and just gets a, rid of a little bit of fluff. But again, having to sacrifice uh, Harry and Hagrid arriving at Ted Tonks, it does kind of suffer later on down the line because obviously there's no character introduction for that. And it does seem that um, they removed lots of the plot line regarding Lupin and Tonks anyways. So maybe it's just par for the course the way that they decided to go uh, that direction um, from a writing standpoint. I like the scene in the ministry where Harry tells Umbridge that she must not tell lies. It's a, uh, it's a cool little callback. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like her, her reaction to it as well as Harry's kind of transforming is really good. The scene in Godric's hollow, I wish was a bit more book accurate, uh, particularly in the graveyard, uh, and at Harry's house. So, 
Um, there's just some magical enchantments that go around uh, Godric's Hollow. Um, you know, Harry's house transforms, or well, not really transforms, it just transfigures itself a little bit differently as they approach it. Same with there's a, what seems to be like a war memorial in the graveyard, and it transforms to a big um, commemoration for uh, James and Lily and Harry. So just a couple of little things like that. But I do think the snake scene uh, and, um, you know, the old lady turning into this, to the snake is really, really well done. It's probably one of the more scary things in the entire series, if I'm not mistaken. But there's um, there's been 10 sequences before, but just the, the old lady transforming into the snake is, is really freaky and just like... When it, it it zooms in on her face and it's like it looks it's like it's she's losing all of the moisture and everything and the life is just being sucked out of her and then out comes a snake. Uh, it's really it's it's probably one of the highlights of the uh, of this movie. The death of Dobby is also handled really well. It's heartbreaking in the book and um, it's done even better like to be able to tug on your heartstrings in this in this movie. Um, you know Dobby was mostly ignored in the films um he's mostly only in the second one but he actually appears he's supposed to appear in the, like the fourth fifth and the sixth but we don't really there's a large gap between when we actually see dobby so um the filmmakers i think did the best job that they could have considering that uh, there's not a lot of um of that character in the other ones to lead up to it and you know kind of pro or like develop harry and dobby's relationship but his, dobby's death is kind of it's still really well executed this movie by far has the worst opening sequence of all of the movies in the series. There's a high-pitched whining noise which symbolizes the Horcrux, and it's just a long, dragged-out uh, intro over the Warner Brothers logo. And then we get a hard cut to Scrimger's eyes and his face all zoomed in. And the sequence that follows is really good where we get to catch up on the trio, and it's almost like they should have just cut that first little bit. All of it just doesn't fit. Like, I know you, they needed to kind of introduce the Minister for Magic to be able to have him in the following scene or in a later scene where he um, delivers Dumbledore's will. So little things like that. But realistically, even in that scene, when Scrimger walks up to the burrow, which he just apparates right in, like he like all protection is just being ignored for the place, apparates right in. And I think it was um, George even says that oh, wow, that's the Minister for Magic. So you didn't have to have that first sequence in the film to be able to, because you tell the audience who that person is anyways later on. The score in the in part one is definitely nothing to get excited about. In my opinion, there's really no standout songs and it's just the most forgettable of the series. There's no, it doesn't have like the John Williams as magic, um, you know, that the first couple of films do. And there's not those more tensionable ones that uh, Nicholas Hooper did. So it just the the score in in part one and part two actually are just it just falls flat. There's nothing to uh, nothing really memorable, um, you know, in them. Why wouldn't they just let Tonks tell Harry that her and Lupin were having a child during the scene in at Privet Drive? Um, she's about to tell Harry, and Mad Eye just walks through and interrupts her. Um, you know, and, and then Tonks and Lupin's son is talked about at uh, the end of the second one when, um, Harry uses the resurrection stone, but it's never stated that Harry ever finds out that Tonks is having a baby. It's not told to the audience. It's not told to Harry. So there's just withheld information. And then it's like, okay, the, it would solve that problem if Mad I actually just let her tell, uh, you know, have another five seconds of speaking time, but it's just creative decisions like that really drag down this movie. And there seems to be lots of little ones that just continually add up. And it seems that the production was just uh, assuming that the audience would figure it out or knew the backstory because they read the books or just didn't care to include it because it wasn't important enough information to be able to tell the audience that hasn't read it um, because it's not super important. I don't know. There's just weird little things like that. The scene with the fighting with the seven potters was very poorly adapted to film. It should have been so much better, and I think it would have been really easy to make it better. But uh, I would expect that that scene is really good and exciting if you haven't read the book. Like when they're going through and driving through traffic and all of that stuff, 
that doesn't happen in the book, but it is a good sequence, and I can respect that they, they did that. And again, this movie has a lot of problems in trying to straddle the line of, do we make it so the fans are going to be happy, or are we going to play to an audience that has never read the books? And it's kind of like they flip-flop back and forth on, on creative decisions like that, but they don't know which side they actually stand on. And it's it seems like this that kind of outlined that kind of confusion that I think they had. It would have been nice to also have them include um, Victor Crumb being at the wedding. Even as just like a person in the crowd, you'd be able to see him or he comes up and says hi to Harry or, or hi to Fleur or something like that. It just, the, again, they just cut silly things probably to keep the runtime down. But then if you're going to cut all of this this stuff, why did you like why bother with having two films? It just uh, it just really doesn't make sense. There's absolutely no explanation on how the Death Eaters find them at the coffee shop. It's assumed later on in the film that we find out that saying Voldemort calls the Death Eaters when they're at Xenophilius Lovegood's place, but it's never explained throughout. And there's a couple of points where they could have easily just said a simple line that would have made it all, like all of the problems or, or that kind of pothole and problem being explained to the audience. And it just seems that them not doing that is just another kind of mistake of where they just overlooked certain elements of the plot. And uh, yeah, because Hermione does say Voldemort's name in this, in the coffee shop and then the death leaders show up pretty much immediately after that. But it's just so many little things. It's like, why didn't it, like I get in some circumstances, it is better to show than tell. But realistically, if you're going to have such a subtle thing that is easy to be overlooked, why wouldn't you just come out and give like a, a single line that says, hey, that name is tabooed. We can't say it. Then it's a done deal. And then the audience knows what's going on. But instead, people are really confused on how the Death Eaters found them in the coffee shop. I can understand why some people might say that they dislike this movie. There's so many parts that do fall flat, probably mostly just for the way that they tried to adapt the novel to film. There's a lot of little explaining that goes uh, that takes place in the book, and sometimes situations and storylines that are like that are hard to translate over in a cohesive matter to film. So I, I, can, I can understand that. But one thing that really starts to get annoying is these high-pitched noises of the Horcruxes. There's like tons of little moments, especially when they have the locket, that there's just this annoying high-pitched noise that's made. And I get that they needed to represent some type of connection with the Horcruxes to Harry, but it just like it's just more annoying and distracting than it is beneficial to the scene. Hermione and Harry's dancing scene is a really good scene to relieve tension of Ron leaving, and it shows their friendship, but it just really does not fit into this mo movie. It's probably too long. It distracts from the slower parts of the movie as well, and it's honestly just <clears throat> a way to make the shippers go crazy. So in the in the sixth book, or sorry, in the sixth movie, Dumbledore straight out straight up asks Harry if he is dating Hermione, and he says no. That was a way to end these uh, questions and these shippers, um, you know, trying to put Harry and uh, Hermione together as a couple, right? Then in, in the, the very next movie, they just be like, all right, well, we're still going to play on this theme multiple times in this movie. It's, it's, and again, this is the same, same directing from movie to movie, and it's just tonally so different, and it doesn't fit, and it's so disjointed. And you see little things like that when you actually are taking a look at it. Why are they including this in? Why are they, um, you know, in one movie they're saying they're not together and then in the next movie they're alluding to it again. At the same time, they're also trying to put Hermione and Ron together. So there's just so, so many things from that perspective, especially from the romance. David Yates probably just didn't know how to direct like the romantic side of things or maybe it was from the writing. I don't know. But it's just so disjointed on the way that they tried to uh, have these relationships and then they, you know, on one, in one movie, they'll absolutely destroy it. And then in the following movie, they're supporting it. It's just, there's, there's no consistencies. And that's where, again, I feel like when they're making this movie is they really just didn't know whether or not to, you know, cater to the fans or cater to the audience that hasn't read the book. You know, and the other thing too is with this dancing scene, had they cut this, they probably could have had a really quick scene with uh, Ted 
Tonks, uh, Dean Thomas, and the Goblin instead had to have just those three characters talking about a couple of things. It would have helped explain some of the plot a little bit better rather than just having an unnecessary scene that is not in the books and just kind of it reverses lots of the romantic um, arcs within the characters. They should have also included the scene with Lupin showing up at Grimald Place in the movie. They could have had this being a short interaction, but it was for sure a necessary one for multiple reasons. Again, I talked about how Tonks wasn't able to tell Harry that her and Lupin were having a baby. This would have been an easy way to put that in, right? Um, so with removing that, again, this is uh, there's no point in time where Harry is ever told that Lupin has a son, yet he knows about it in the, um, you know, at the end. If you haven't read the books, uh, that simple... Um, thing of Tonks touching her stomach and saying, we got something else to tell you, right? If the audience hasn't seen the first one or forgot about that, that that happened in the first one, this, the Harry talking about it in this one line in the second part, people are just gonna be like, oh, right. How did we figure that out? Well, we didn't because we were never told we were never sh truly shown. So it's just like, there's that level of disjointedness just, and this scene having Lupin show up at Grimald Place could have solved all of it. I like the description of the Lovegood's house from the books more than it was portrayed in the movie, at least from the exterior. As it's the, in the books, it's described as a rook chess piece, which basically just looks like a castle turret. Um, while in the movie, it's made to look like a just a lopsided tower. So it's not as good, in my opinion. The shaky cam when they're running from the snatchers in the forest is awful to watch, but it is a very intense scene. They really screwed up by not having Peter Pettigrew kill himself with his uh, metal hand. it's It wasn't a big addition, uh, but it would have just been better to see that as it fits the story better than Dobby just knocking him out and then him not appearing in the rest of the film. Um, I get probably, it was probably a little bit violent to keep their, um, uh, their like their ratings for, the, for their audience in a certain way. So I'm assuming that's why it was cut. Harry uses the two-way mirror that was given to him by Sirius in the books, uh, but this never takes place in the movies, and it's never explained uh, at all in the movies about it. So there's a large hot, uh, there's a large plot hole that probably could have been solved two two movies ago, just by including um, uh, a scene where Harry gets the two-way mirror. Now, he also wears the pouch that Hagrid gave him, uh, where he keeps things uh, such as the mirror, the snitch, his broken wand, and stuff like that. And again, this could have probably should have just been included in in the movie. It would have been able to, you know, just given a little bit more of of certain things because it's described in the book as basically where he keeps all the broken things and the things that actually have no value to him because he doesn't have they don't have any utility to him. But he keeps all of these broken things essentially in a pouch around his neck. Um, I think it would have been a good thing to include. The other thing I think would have added a lot of like. Um, um, kind of like a, a character moment between him and Mrs. Weasley is Mrs. Weasley giving him his deceased or her deceased brother's watch for when he turns 17. It's like a wizard custom to give a 17 year old when they come of age, uh, a watch. And she gave, um, Harry her dead brothers. Now, if you, it's, this is definitely more prevalent in the books is that the, the Weasleys become Harry's like adoptive family, basically. Um, you know, and eventually he does marry into that family, but it just, there's little sequences like that, which, you know, I think would have been good to see on film. This movie has a lot of trouble with only explaining half of things that are important to the plot. Either the audience just has to go with it, or there's just, um, you know, go with whatever limited explanation that we have, or the reader, or the, the audience has read the books and know what's happened, and things then just get overlooked. This movie is one that just really gets glossed over, perhaps because it's mostly set up for part two, where all of the action is. But there's just, there's nothing super bad about this movie, but there's just nothing really stand out. And I think that basically sums up part one of uh, The Deathly Hallows. And now on to part two. This movie opens up with Lily's theme, which is one of the best songs from the series and for sure the best song from the Deathly Hallows movies. I had said that the, the uh, scores just fall flat and they definitely do but this one is the one highlight of the scores in these movies helena bonham carter playing emma watson playing hermione pretending to be bellas bellatrix the strange is done really good in the movie one thing that trips me up is the voice when using the polyjuice potion 
in the books, the voice changes, but uh, in the movies, it mostly doesn't. I think um, Mad Eye in the fourth one, uh, Barty Crouch, when he transforms into Mad Eye, his voice changes. But um, you know, for uh, in the other movies, the voice retains that of the original person. It's just a filmmaking thing, but I think they should have just used the that um, the original person's voice. But or sorry, not the original person's the person they transformed into, but. Um, this portrayal of Bellatrix is done so good, um, and you can see that just the complexity, complexity of using the Polyjuice Potion and pretending to be a different person is just done masterfully by Helena Bonham Carter. We're also introduced to Aberforth Dumbledore, who is played by um, Kyria Hines, who played Mance Raider in Game of Thrones. He plays this role really well. Uh, in the books... Um, he tells the Death Eaters off while protecting the trio at um, at his pub. And it's a very funny scene. Uh, probably just cut for time, but uh, I do like that interaction where he's calling them idiots because they don't know the difference between a goat and a, a stag. Snape's memories were handled really, really well, and it's probably the best part of the entire movie. Alan Rickman is, again, just unbelievable in this role. The whole sequence... Um, of uh, of the memories that he has uh, that he gave to Harry in the pensive is worth rewatching, and it translates so well over from the book to the movie. There is obviously some stuff that they had to cut, but pretty much every it hits all of the beats, all of the important parts of the stuff that Snape had to show Harry. When Harry returns to Hogwarts, there are so many little mistakes uh, in the room of requirement. First of all, why did Luna return to Hogwarts when she was safe at Bill and Fleur's and had escaped the Malfoy's dungeon? So the Carols and the Death Eaters would obviously be looking for her. She does show up, but she actually shows up after the trio meet with Neville and, and, and enter the room of requirement. But in the movie, she's just already there. Um, as is Dean Thomas. Dean Thomas um, didn't return to Hogwarts as he's a half-blood and he had no proof of his father's blood status. So he goes on the run. Um, so he wasn't actually in in Hogwarts either. He does show up after, but he, and and, the, and in the books, the trio actually meet him uh, in Malfoy Manor as well, and they bring him to Bill and Fleur's too. So those two characters kind of misplaced there. Um, Cormac McLaggen, who is in the sixth movie, is there for some reason. He finished, so he was in the year ab- above Harry, so he did his seventh year while Harry was in his sixth year, as did Cho Chang, um, and they're, they're for some reason in there, now, I know Cho did show up, but again, she showed up after Harry had already entered there, not before. We also get a previously graduated student uh, who appears in the Great Hall. She was also in the year ahead of Harry, and that's Katie Bell. So there's just, there's a lot of little errors, and, and it's almost like instead of hiring an extra, they brought back a character just to have a more familiar face in the crowd, but it's like that person wouldn't have been there. So uh, I don't know whose fault that is, but it's definitely something that shouldn't have been overlooked. Um, there also would have been a lot more order members and graduated students that would have fought in the Battle of Hogwarts. Um, but the, basically the people that just show up are, are the Weasleys and a couple of other order members. But there's just tons of little plot inconsistencies when comparing the books to the Battle of Hogwarts. But the action sequences are done incredibly well. This movie misses so many beats also regarding uh, Ravenclaw's diadem. The conversation with the Grey Lady is drastically different in the books. Um, this is probably, <clears throat> some of these changes were probably, um, there just because there's certain aspects that were ignored, um, in, in other sequences. So it'd be hard to kind of shoehorn it all in and make it, uh, fit all fit properly to be able to kind of tie in some of those other beats, uh, that happened, you know, they have no mention of the bloody Baron being the one that actually killed the gray lady and stuff like that. So just a little bit of differences. Um, Ron speaking parcel tongue is incredibly dumb in the books and it's incredibly or it's infinitely worse on screen. It makes no sense. You know, when I remember when I, the first time reading it and reading that Ron was speaking parcel tongue and went down into the chamber of secrets, I was like this is the stupidest plot point in this entire book. Maybe the entire series. It is so incredibly stupid. Why she chose to do that, I have no idea. It's just, again, she just it just seems like a rushed uh rushed idea. Neville also doesn't love Luna. I think they added this kind of um, dr- uh, point in the film just to add a little bit more drama that is unnecessary. Draco Malfoy operates into Hogwarts, which breaks a rule that has been reiterated multiple times through the books and movies, is that you can't operate within Hogwarts. 
Um, this also uh, literally happened in the sixth movie um, where Dumbledore, where Harry asked Dumbledore, I thought you couldn't operate in, in and out of Hogwarts. And he says, well, being me has a certain amount of like benefits, but um, there's just, it's, there's so many plot holes in having a character operate in it. It's just stupid oversights like this. Ron also should have hugged Harry when uh, Hermione did before Harry goes down. It's the last time he's going to see his best friend because they think they're just assuming that he's going to die and, ne- and not come back. Um, I think it would have just been a little bit more fitting for the character. Like they just have a longing stare at, at each other while Harry's looking over Hermione's sh- shoulder. It just, it's, it's kind of weak. <clears throat> why would, uh, speaking of hugs, why would Voldemort hug Draco? It is so awkward and out of character. Voldemort doesn't show any affection for other characters, and he particularly despises the Malfoy family. It's like the writers of the screenplay just really didn't read the books or understand the character dynamics between them. Neville also killed the snake before Harry's final showdown with Voldemort. Um, and when Voldemort died, I really disliked how he just turned to dust. It was like just he got, he got Thanos snapped, and that was it. Um... This final altercation took place in the Great Hall in front of everybody. And once he died, he just fell to the ground and they ended up moving his body into a room next to the Great Hall. But in the movie, it's basically him and Harry alone in the courtyard and then he just turns to dust. It's, 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 it's bad. In the movie, Harry is happy when he's walking around the Great Hall. But in the book, he's really sad about all the people who had to die to protect him. And he also doesn't want to be there, which prompts Luna to help him leave under his invisibility cloak. Everyone's triumphant smiles seem out of place considering how many people had died in this. It's just totally, completely off. I remember being really pissed off with Harry breaking the Elder Wand in two. In the book, he repairs his broken wand and then intends to put the Elder Wand back in Dumbledore's grave. The final scene on the bridge should have actually taken place in Dumbledore's office. It's just a poor ending with the trio just standing on the bridge, just looking, looking into nothingness. Granted, the book's final scene wasn't the best either, um, more from a way that she tried to wrap it up. But why change this setting from Dumbledore's office, which they already had the set built and used in this film, to being alone on the bridge? It's just silly changes like this. Just, I think, like, it's really... I think for avid fans of any fan base, for that matter, moving away and making changes from the source material usually just causes more annoyances and harm than good. When adapting um, things to movies, I get there's things that has to be changed, mostly for just runtime, but you should make it for the fans. The fans will bring in new fans, like like they'll bring in, um, you know, a, a date or they'll bring in their kids or whatever, but... <clears throat> the fans will bring in new fans and it's way easier to market it that way rather than trying to attract new ones to your fandom. And Hollywood gets this backwards so often when adapting properties, Marvel and Disney do like they, those shit on the existing fan base because they think they're going to attract new people. It's like, if you just maintain your existing fan base, they will bring you more fans. It's so simple. Um, you know, and I have ripped into, other movies about changing things, uh, like the other Harry Potter movies, about changing things or taking certain creative liberties and straying from the source material. But this film takes it to a whole new level. And in my opinion, part two really suffers from that, uh, more so than part one did, even though there's problems with that too. With the epilogue uh, 19 years later, they should have included the other characters that were in that scene, not just the trio. Uh, Like Teddy Lupin would have been a good character to put in there. Um, you know, this scene is another one for me that just falls flat other than it's seemingly like only goal is to just hammer home that like Snape's character arc and stuff like that. There just isn't much else to it when it was being adapted. And again, I guess that's kind of the point of this epilogue in the book. And, but it just seems that the only purpose of this scene is to reaffirm to everybody, um, like Snape's sacrifice and, and his character arc. Um, which I, I, yeah, I have just some problems with the way that it was executed. It does have a really redeeming song choice, which is leaving Hogwarts, which is actually from uh, the first film. Then the credits open with Hedwig's theme. These uh, two songs are kind of the best way that uh, the movie could have ended. And, you know, uh, in this movie's score, apart from Lily's theme, there's not much to it. So it's kind of ironic and nice that we get to hear John Williams' music uh, to close out the series because 
in my opinion, it's the best mu- music of the entire series. I think the credits of this movie also should have been greater than it was. If you look at a movie like Endgame, which summed up a 10-year endeavor spanning multiple movies, they did a really good job at the credits to honoring actors that were able to put it all together. And in hindsight, it's too bad that this credit sequence didn't have something like that rather than just the boring black background. But I do have an edit that someone put together where they did an Endgame style credit sequence for Harry Potter. And I have that linked in the description box so you can check that out. And now some overall comments. Now, these movies, all of these movies could have been benefited by sticking closer to the source material. I get that there's lots of things that would need to be cut in order to make the run time less, but um, there's so many little things that I think really make the movies so much better and a little bit more magical. And with the changes and inconsistencies, minor fans, especially ones that only watched the movies, will have lots of plot presumptions that are wrong about the series. More consistent themes, especially in the later movies with the color palette, are are quite distracting. Um, So fixing some of those things would have been a little bit better. The Deathly Hallows movies are also plagued by the sins of the father in regards of having to clean up and balance out things that were, you know, set up or missed in the prior entries. I remember in the fifth movie, they were going to cut Creature in order to save some time, but JK insisted that he had a larger role to play later on. That specific movie was being made prior to that book being published, so things like that started to add up more and more over these two movies, and I think that you might have lost a little bit more so uh, than the other films if you haven't read the book while trying to watch these movies. Ron really comes into his own the, the most in this book in comparison to others. He started to really grow as a character in the sixth book, and he really steps up in a few different ways and really re- reaches his potential, especially as a duelist. I don't think I said this before in any of the other reviews, but Voldemort's appearance isn't as book accurate as I would like, mostly around the eyes, but the CGI on him is impeccable and it is so well done and holds up really well. Why didn't Harry utilize Creature as much as he could have? It's like once they left Grimmauld Place, JK just abandoned Creature's ability to help the trio. Why wouldn't they have just used the killing curse on Nagini? They didn't need the sword to kill the snake. I also don't think that Snape had to die. I wonder if there's a version of the story where J.K. actually kept him alive. Like, had Voldemort never questioned the allegiance of the wand and Snape was able to distance himself from Voldemort, he might have been able to survive. I think that Dumbledore's overarching plan would have actually, would have, like, kept Snape alive. Why didn't they use Hermione's bag during the Battle of Seven Potters? They could have put Hedwig and Harry's firebolt in there and they would have been saved and not having given him away to the Death Eaters as quickly. The first time reading the book, I knew that Harry would have to die, and I was content if he did, and that was the end of the story. Had Harry not survived the series, I would not have been upset. What hallow would I want most? I think this decision is a a large large psychological description of who you are. Uh, If it were me, I think the cloak would be really cool, but I would want the wand because I think it would be the most practical day-to-day and it would offer more utility than the cloak. And that's it for the Deathly Hallows. This series has been really fun to do. I consume lots of Harry Potter content and I'm a big fan of the series. I think my largest takeaway from going through all of this is how magical the world of Harry Potter is, especially if you're reading it for the first time. There is lots of little things that I'd forgotten over the years and it was really good to reread it and uh, be able to take it in again. I think that something that is going to be really enjoyable is when I can introduce my kids to Harry Potter and even some other uh, franchises and stuff like that. But um, for for them to be able to experience this for the first time and, and, you know, and reading and watching it is something that I'm excited to be able to join in with them for this. Thanks for listening to this episode. And if you like the stuff that I was talking about this episode, hit that like button and share it with a friend that likes Harry Potter. Have a great day. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. It helps when you stand up to them. It gives everyone hope. I was trying to make a world of which he could live a happier life. Those who are best suited to power are those who have never sought it. Do not pity the dead, Harry. Pity the living, and above all, those who live without love. Stay free. Thank you for listening to the Schmidt House podcast. If you want to support the show, you can do so by sending Bitcoin or through Give, Send, Go. Links for those are in the description box. I would really appreciate it as I want to keep the podcast ad-free. The Schmidt House podcast is available on the following platforms. YouTube, Odyssey, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and most importantly, Rumble. 
I post exclusive content on Rumble that is not found on any of the other platforms. I call them shorts. Please like this video, subscribe, and enable notifications, but most importantly, share this show with your friends. Check out the description box for more information about things that I discussed this episode and how to get in contact with me. Please reach out to me with any questions or suggestions that you have, including topics that you would like to hear me discuss. Have a great day.